So let's begin. Good evening, Professor Panet, and welcome everybody. It is my pleasure to kick off the third series of our webinars with our own experts from the Hebrew University. This week, we will focus on the possibility treatment, on, on the possible treatments to prevent COVID-19 and discuss drug development and vaccines. Today, we have the great pleasure to host Professor Amos Panet from the Hebrew University's Faculty of Medicine. Professor Panet is an expert in virus replication and the ability to design and engineer viruses. His webinar will focus on how easy or difficult it will be to develop drugs and vaccines for the coronavirus. Professor Panet, please. Hi, thank you. Thank you everybody for coming to, to my lecture. First, I would like to, to host you in my, in my home uh, I'm sorry that I cannot give you coffee and, and cake, but anyhow, uh, I will tell you more about uh, drugs and vaccines and how we plan now to, to develop and expedite the development of drugs and vaccine against the coronavirus. First, let me tell you a few things about my background. Uh, I've been studied at the Hebrew University in my basic studies. And then I spent some five years at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at MIT in Boston. And then I returned and started my own laboratory at the Faculty of Medicine. And I've been researching since then viruses. I worked on several viruses. I started with HIV, the AIDS virus, during the great epidemics of the 80s, and we'll hear about it more today. Then I shifted to herpes, herpes viruses, and again, I will mention them today. And lately, I've been working on influenza virus. Again, we'll hear about it later. And in the last two months, my laboratory has shifted gears, and now we are all enlisted to work on coronaviruses and we are establishing now new systems on coronaviruses and I will tell you about them later on. So my, my laboratory is situated here at Enkarim. It's uh, west of Jerusalem, about 10 kilometers from Jerusalem on the Judea Hills, a beautiful, beautiful hills, beautiful view. And uh, what we see here on the left, of course, is a subject of my lecture, the coronavirus. So let me, let me tell you what we are going to, to discuss today. We are going to discuss first the current diagnostics and therapies or for the coronavirus. Now we are at a stage of diagnostics. It's very important, as you hear in the news and later on the therapist will come to the front. I will discuss the main approaches how to develop antiviral drugs. And then I will go to how we develop specifically drugs to coronavirus and how we expedite the, the program in order to be able to treat people even in this epidemic, not to wait for the next one. Then I will discuss vaccines against viral diseases. We have many successes, but we have also many failures in the design of vaccines. And finally, I will speak about the prospects for future pandemics, either of coronaviruses, other coronaviruses, perhaps the flu viruses, or maybe some unknown viruses that we don't recognize yet. So let me start with some history. We, we know of uh, pandemics, big pandemics, since 2000 years. And we don't have any record before 2000 years ago. And that's probably because there were much less travel, human population is more, was more sparse. But in the last 2000 years, we had the, the Black Death, which was caused by a bacteria, not by a virus, by bacteria which is called Yersinia pestis, and this is also called 
the bubonic plague, and in the Middle Ages, it has killed, the estimation is about 200 million people in Europe. And it took 200 years for the European population to recover from this terrible, from this terrible plague. Then the smallpox, smallpox came a bit later, and the smallpox is a virus. Again, it was in Europe. It started in China. At that time, there were also travel between China and Europe through the Silk Route, and uh, probably the virus was transported from China through Turkey, through Greece, and to Europe. Then we had the Spanish flu, the Spanish influenza, and you all heard about the Spanish influenza. It hit first America, the United States, and then Europe at the end of the First World War in 1918. It started in army camps in the United States, and then soldiers, US soldiers, which went to help the Allied forces in Europe, brought them to Europe. The Spanish name is not, is not a good name because it's not, it didn't come from, from Spain. We had the, also the plague, the same plague that we see here caused by a bacteria also came earlier, just at the fifth century and sixth century, and also killed uh, about 30 to 50 million people. What we don't have here is the AIDS epidemic. The AIDS epidemic, which came in the 80s of the last century, probably most of you remember this, this pandemic. The AIDS pandemic killed about 60 million people around the world. But then at the 90s of last century, we found the, the magic cocktail, three drugs that can suppress the virus. And since then, the death toll is much lower, and I will discuss it later. So that's about the history of all the pandemics in human history. Uh, and now we are dealing with the, what is the origin of pandemics. Well, usually pandemics come from an animal microorganisms. All the pandemics, pandemics that I've showed you in the previous slide came from different microorganisms and sometimes microorganisms adapt to infect human, and once they infect human, probably they undergo a mutation, they change their mode of spread, and they start spreading from human to human. The first jump from animal to human is very complicated. It doesn't happen very often. That's why epidemics are coming and repeating every 50 years, every 100 years, but not every, every 10 years, because this is a very rare event. Now, the epidemics after, after that are spread by travel. Before we had an aeroplane in, invention, there were no, not the aeroplane and the ship in, uh, travel, there were no, uh, no plague spreading because people did not travel much. Nowadays, you, uh, uh, microorganisms can travel overnight from China to the United States, from the United States to Israel and all around the world. So spread of the epidemics now is very fast and we are all living now in a small village really. There is no point to show borders of countries and states where the virus doesn't recognize them. And finally, there is a density of human population. We are now about 7 billion, 7 milliard people in the world. We live in big cities in high crowded population. And of course, this contribute to the spread of the virus. You can see here the, 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 the density of the people, the aeroplane, vehicle for the, for the uh, microorganisms and the animals which cause the initiation of the spread. In the, corona, in the coronavirus, 
the spread probably started from bat. We don't know whether there was an intermediate animal or from bat, it went, went directly to human. It's not clear yet. Now for the detection, how we detect the coronavirus infection. We hear a lot today in the news about the lack of diagnosis. Too few people are being diagnosed. It happened nearly in every country. Now the problem is in the United States, as you know, uh, because the uh, diagnosis of the virus started quite late. And, but now it's running and all the countries are very fast adapting to fast diagnosis of the virus. The main method for diagnosis of the virus is by diagnosis, diagnosis of the RNA of the virus. The RNA of the virus is a genome, the genetic code of the virus. It's not in DNA like we have DNA as a genetic code, as a, a genome. This virus has an RNA, which is similar to DNA, but not exactly the same. We have a method to amplify this RNA, and we can amplify this RNA that we form a patient from a from the mouse. Short a span of time within one hour and then by, by a method which is called PCR and after amplification of the RNA we can detect it by a usual detection. It's very and very accurate but we need to do a lot of it. We need to eventually go to even people without a disease and check whether they carry the virus or not. Only by this way, we'll be able to contain the virus eventually in a month or two months. The other method to identify infection is by the response of the body who was, in, who was with the virus. Once we are infected with the virus, any virus, are we making antibodies? These antibodies are the defense of the body against the virus. These antibodies, which are in the bloodstream, recognize the virus and they can kill the virus. They hook on the virus and they inactivate the virus. So we have a very good defense system. It's coming a bit late because these antibodies are induced in the body. So first week we have very little the virus and we have very easy means to identify the virus in the bloodstream of the covered from the disease. And these antibodies, I will discuss them later, serve us now as a therapy for people who are sick, very sick with coronavirus, who squash to, to, down, to downplay the, the virus and help the patient. Uh, Professor Panet? Yes. We had some um, problems with the internet. So if you can uh, uh, explain again uh, the last uh, few minutes, because we couldn't hear you. We, the origin of pandemics you hear, you heard? Uh, yes, after that, it was okay. a bit difficult. Okay, so I will, I will repeat again how we detect the virus. What is the basis for the diagnosis of the virus? What we do now in all countries to identify infected people. So the virus uh, information code, the genome of the virus is RNA. It's similar to DNA that we have. We have DNA as our information. The virus has RNA. We can take a swab from the mouse of a patient and put it in a machine. The machine is called P 
PCR, and the machine know how to, to amplify small amounts of the virus, of the RNA of the virus, and multiply it millions and billions of times. So we get large amount of the RNA, and this RNA is easy now to identify by standard means of, of identification. Another way of uh, looking for uh, infection is taking the patients or even people after they recovered from the disease, taking a blood sample, and within the blood, we have the antibodies. Antibodies are produced by our immune system. Once a virus infects us, we are, uh, our immune system come into action and they produce, immune system produce antibodies to the bloodstream. So in our bloodstream, we see and we, we can detect antibodies and these antibodies help in protecting us from the virus. These antibodies hook specifically to the virus and inactivate the virus. We have now standard means to identify these antibodies and we can take from the recovered person, take portion of his blood, a blood sample, and isolate from its antibodies. And these antibodies can serve now by injecting them to a sick patient to help in uh, uh, curing the patient from the virus. I will come to it later. Okay, let's, let's shift now to drugs. How do we develop drugs against viruses? We have now several drugs against viruses, not as many as we have antibiotics against bacteria, but there are sev several viruses that we have drugs and we can really help patient infected with these drugs. And we are looking eventually for drugs against the corona that we don't have yet. So let's see what are the targets, how we can block a, a virus from, infected, from infecting a cell or infecting a patient. The virus come and infect a cell in the patient. In the case of coronavirus, the virus infects the lungs. And the cells which constitute the lungs get infected, the virus come into the cell and we have inhibitors for other viruses like HIV that can block the entry of the virus into the cell. Then if the virus managed to get into the cell, the virus now start replicating its RNA, its genome, its genetic information. And one virus gets into the cell and it can make 10,000 copies of its genome within 12, 15 hours. Once it replicate and make many copies of its gene, each, each genome is covered by a protein, by proteins, and they now go and exit from the cell. So one virus infects the cell and thousands of viruses emerge out of the cell to infect other cells or to infect uh, other patients, other people. Now, so we can block the replication of the virus. We have drugs in the case of HIV to block the replication of the virus. And we have drugs to block the exit of the virus from the cell. So we have at least three groups of inhibitors of virus drugs, antiviral drugs, entry, replication, and exit. And I will discuss now some viruses and how we develop drugs for them that now help us a lot in the fight against these viruses. And they give us a lesson how to develop drugs against the coronavirus. First, herpes virus. Uh, many of you know herpes viruses. Uh, some people have these cold sores, which are uh, in the lips, 
which comes and go depending on, on a person. About 10% of the population have this repeated uh, cold sores. Sometimes this virus can go and sit uh, in the uh, ganglions and sometimes it go to the brain and it can cause damage to, to the brain. It's called encephalitis. Then we have herpes virus type two, which caused a sex, sexual disease, sex, trans, sex transmitted disease. And finally, we have herpes zoster, which caused shingles. Shingles are uh, wounds which are in the back of a person, very painful uh, infection. And for these drugs, we, for these diseases, we have now a drug. And the drug was invented early, back in 1977, by a brilliant scientist called Gertrude Ilion, who worked in a company at the time. And she got a Nobel Prize for her invention. She had very brilliant idea. She took a component of the nucleic acid of the genome of the virus, just a, a small building block of the nucleic acid of the genome of the virus. And they modified it slightly by chemical modification, such that this cannot serve anymore as a building block, but as a poison and something which will stop the virus from replicating. This is a drug. It's called uh, different brand names. It's called acyclovir or Zodivax. And it, it is sold now in every pharmacy for the indications that I showed you before. So this is a drug against herpes viruses. And it showed that for the first time, 1977, that in fact, we can develop drugs against viruses. Until that time, people thought that, well, we have antibiotics against bacteria, but it would be impossible to develop drugs against viruses because viruses use the host metabolism for its replication. So if we poison the virus, we will poison also the host, the patient. But that's as uh, Dr. Ilion has showed us, this is not uh, true. And follow her, 1977, many of you still remember the AIDS epidemics, which came in the late 70s, early 80s. And this epidemic really started at the early 20th century in Africa. It was a virus of chimpanzees, and it jumps from chimpanzees to human, and then again travel, brought it to San Francisco, if you remember, in the, in the early 80s. And, and it started a big epidemic, first in a gay community, but later in a heterosexual uh, population. And at, at the beginning, the government didn't pay much attention. They said it's a gay disease. Uh, but then uh, there were huge demonstrations in San Francisco, in New York. And finally, the government, mostly the government of uh, Bush, Bush is the elder, and uh, Clinton uh, gave a lot of money for research. And this research gave fruits. And nowadays, we have over 30 drugs, approved drugs against HIV, against the AIDS disease. And these drugs block all the stages in the virus infections that I have showed you before. Some of the drugs blocked the entry of the virus. Some of the drugs block the replication of the virus. And some of the drugs block exit of the virus from the infected cell. And thus, three drugs, what we call a cocktail, is able now to block the disease. And you can see now a <clears throat> statistics of 
uh, infected people and number of deaths from AIDS infection. You can see what happened in 1995 to the curve of death in a, a population of infected people. It has dropped very fast. In 1997 already, we had very low, relatively low death from the AIDS disease. You can see that the number of infection has continued to rise up because this virus, this virus can be treated with a cocktail, with the three drugs. And you can see here, once you give the drugs, this is the amount of virus in the blood stream of a, of a, a, of a patient. You can see that once you give the three drugs, the amount of virus goes down, sometimes to an undetectable level. But if you stop the treatment, the virus immediately come up. So we have not gotten rid of the virus. We have just suppressed the virus. And this uh, population, which, which are infected with the virus, needs to take the drug, the cocktail, for their, for, their, for their life until we will find a cure, a real cure from the virus. Then I will speak about influenza and how we develop drugs against influenza, but we'll see whether these drugs are useful. So influenza, by the way, is very similar to the coronavirus, but it's less pathogenic. It's less pathogenic. The death from influenza usually affect older people. And uh, if we look at statistics in bad winters, only about 0.1% of the population are dying from influenza. Whereas in the coronavirus, the numbers are from a 2% to 10%, depending on the country. So uh, for sure that uh, coronavirus is much more dangerous, much more infectious than influenza virus. Anyhow, influenza virus has the same, uh, the same effects, fever, headache, running nose, cough, sore throat, tiredness, and body muscle ache, like we have at the beginning of the corona infection. The influenza virus have many hosts. You see, human is just one of the hosts of influenza virus. It can infect chicken, it can infect uh, all kinds of animals. Cat, tigers, whatever you, you name, influenza can, can infect it, mice. And therefore, it's so difficult to avoid transport or transfer of the, of the influenza from animals to human. Another property of influenza is that influenza changes very rapidly. It has going through mutation, very, very fast mutation. So the influenza that we have this winter will not come again next winter, but another virus similar, his cousin will come back, but it will be a bit different from the influenza which, which is today. So every year, we are experiencing, experiencing different influenza, and that's why we have to get a, a vaccination every year against influenza. Just one influenza does not help. Now we go to the Spanish influenza that I mentioned before, the influenza of 1918, and this was a big pandemic. You can see a military hospital in the United States, and you can see how many people are uh, in this, how many patients are in this hospital. It was a terrible situation and about between 20 to 40 million people died out of this, out of this disease. Uh, 
do we have drugs against influenza? Well, we have drug. We have a drug against influenza, which is called Tamiflu. Tamiflu is quite a good drug, but Tamiflu is good if we take it at the beginning of infection. You can see here when infection starts at day zero, if we take the, inf at the drug at day zero or before, the influenza would not be able to replicate. But if we take the drug, let's say after four days, when we feel the disease, you can see that the disease, the feelings, you know, the fever, the, the aches, the tiredness, appears only four days after the infection. So we, do, we go to the doctor at day four and we complain about the disease, about the influenza. Look where the virus is at four days. The virus is replicating at day one, day two, day three. And at day four, we don't have a virus anymore. So we have a drug. But when we take the drug at day four, it doesn't have any, any effect and any use. So not every drug can help a patient. So just now what we have for flu is really not much, just to sit and, and drink tea. Now, what are the potential drugs against coronavirus? We have several drugs what, which are now in intensive uh, clinical trials. There is a chloroquine, which uh, President Trump mentioned several days ago. This drug has been tested by the Chinese two months ago, and it showed some favorable effects. And there is now extensive trials to see whether chloroquine is good for the current epidemics. We are using now anti-HIV drugs. We are using some of the drugs against HIV, which we think might be good for the coronavirus. We don't have a clear evidence that they are really helping, but since we don't have much else, we, we use it. And then we use a, a new drug, which is called Remedisivir, which was developed by a company in California, Gilead Company. It inhibits virus replication. It inhibits this step in the infection of the virus, the replication of the uh, genome of the virus. And what we have is antibodies that I mentioned before, which are derived from corona patients. We take a blood sample from the corona patient after their recovery, and we can isolate antibodies and use them for therapy. You can see here what happened following infection with a virus, with coronavirus or any virus. The virus start replicating very early in the infection. Usually the virus replicate in the first week. And after the first week, really the virus cause a damage and the person who was infected start feeling the disease, the consequence of the infection. And then antibodies, our immune system gets into action and the immune system start producing antibodies. Now we can take the blood from this individual, purify the antibodies and inject the antibodies to uh, the sick patient. And there are good evidence now that this type of treatment is helping serious diseased person. Okay, I will go now to vaccination. And uh, I will go and first tell you what are, where we succeeded, where, would, where do we have effective va vaccines. So just viruses that you may know is a polio, the, the child diseases, rubella, measles, mumps. We have very good vaccines against this virus. 
We have very good vaccines against hepatitis viruses, hepatitis B and hepatitis A, which cause liver damage, liver cirrhosis. And we have also a vaccine against varicella zoster. This is a shingle, shingle virus. We haven't succeeded yet in producing vaccines against HIV, against many other viruses, and even against influenza virus, we don't have a good, good vaccine. Since we have the smallpox back in the 19th century or, 17, or 18th century, then Paul Ehrlich in Germany, Paul Jenner is from England, uh, Paul Ehrlich from uh, Germany, then Salk, Jonas Salk, which developed the a vaccine against polio, and uh, Maurice Hellman, which in, from the United States, who developed all the vaccines against children diseases, the rubella, the measles, and the mumps. And these four brilliant scientists deserve a lot of, a lot of credit for preventing death and disease for hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. This is just a, a cartoon of how Edward Jenner, a country doctor, injected the vaccine which he developed uh, to a small child and save this child from the terrible epidemics of the smallpox. Now what happens during vaccination? When we vaccine, vaccinate a person, it's similar to in, injecting a virus to a person or infecting somebody with a virus. The vaccine is in the blood. Some vaccines can replicate in the person, in the vaccinated person, like all the children diseases, the mumps, the, the measles, and the rubella, they replicate in the children. And then the children develop immunity against the virus, against the attenuated virus. It's a weak virus which can infect but cannot cause a disease. But the uh, immune system nonetheless sees it as a virus and produce high titers of antibody. Now the next time when the same person is infected with a virus, with a, a infectious virus, which usually cause a disease, these antibodies are ready in his blood circulation to kill the incoming virus and prevent the disease. So this is a principle of vaccination. If we can take the virus which cause a disease and make him weak by different means so that it would not cause a disease, but it will enhance the immune system to get immunity. So what do we do for coronaviruses? We use different approaches, different approaches for vaccination. We take either a virus, like infectious coronavirus, we kill it by a chemical means. So we kill the infectious activity of the virus, but we still maintain the virus structure and we inject it into a person and the immune system again is activated by this virus. That's how Jonas Salk developed the first polio vaccine. Or we can have an attenuated virus, a virus which is still alive, but is weakened and cannot cause a disease. So we do all of these approaches with the coronavirus. A more modern approach is to produce the proteins of the virus, of the coronavirus, by engineering it into some type of 
vector, and by biotechnology methods, we can produce what we call a recombinant virus, a recombinant a protein, and this protein, once we inject to a patient, will be immunogenic, will induce the immune system of the, of the person, and again, will cause the elicitation of antibodies. So all of these methods are used constantly to uh, develop uh, the vaccine. And there are now several clinical trials with the three approaches of the, for the coronavirus. And I hope that within a year, but certainly not less than a year, we will have a vaccine against coronavirus. Once we'll have a vaccine, of course, we hope that we'll be over this, uh, this pandemic. So it wouldn't be for this pandemic, but it will be for the next pandemic of coronavirus. So now the question is, how important is a vaccine against coronavirus right now? So I think that the coronavirus will take a year to develop, as I told you before, but uh, the coronavirus will be good for the next epidemic with coronavirus, but we are not sure whether the coronavirus will come ever again. We know that the SARS, the SARS coronavirus, which came and made a small epidemic in the early uh, uh, to, in, the, uh, in, the two, in 2003, never returned back to us. But maybe this coronavirus will come back to us like the influenza virus, and then we will need, certainly will need a good vaccination. Now, finally, what we do in our lab for, to, to help in, the, in this uh, effort to find a cure for the, for the coronavirus, what we established in our laboratory at uh, Adassa uh, Hebrew University Medical School, we engineer the protein that is usually on the surface of the coronavirus. We take this protein from a coronavirus and we can coat a virus which is attenuated virus, virus which is not dangerous, virus which has, cannot uh, cause disease. We call this protein on the uh, surface of the virus. So we have a virus with a specificity of coronavirus because the specificity, the infection capability is, a, is uh, determined by this spike protein that you see here. That's why we call it coronavirus because of the corona that we see on the surface of the, of the virus. And the corona a virus is attached to a receptor on the cell. And after attachment to the receptor, the coronavirus is able usually to enter the cell. But now we have a virus which is not virulent, doesn't cause any disease it will in recognize the receptor, infect the cell, but now if we test different drugs, perhaps we can find drugs which block the binding of the virus to the cell, block the virus to the receptor. So we hope that we will do screening of many drugs and find drugs that block virus entry, coronavirus entry into the cell. And we hope that within several months, we will have candidates for, a, for further drug development. And hopefully, uh, even before this epidemic goes away, we'll be able to treat people with it. And finally, last slide, what are the prospects for, a, what are the pros prospects for containment of the coronavirus pandemic? So we have now all over the world uh, extensive programs for the development of drugs. Both in China, started in China. Recently, uh, President Trump 
uh, gave some uh, several billions of dollars for the development, for expedite the development of drugs. There is expedite effort in developing uh, new vaccines, but it will take more time. I believe that drugs will have drugs within several months, perhaps two months. And still what we have is an old technique, isolation. We all sit home now and uh, using measuring and protective equipment uh, against the virus. No other mean for protection right now. Once we'll have drugs, we'll be in much better situation. What are the predictions for future epidemics? My prediction as a virologist, I've been working on viruses for, for many decades. There will be epidemics in the future. I don't know whether it will be coronavirus type or influenza virus or other viruses that are uh, in the animal and we don't know them yet. But we'll have to prepare better than we prepared for, for the last uh, pandemic and we should we should prepare like, a, as I said before, a small village, not like different countries, 150 different countries, each have a different preparation from the next pandemic. And finally, thank you for your attention. And uh, I would be happy to, to take questions now. And Mara will, uh, will take over now and uh, Mara will get the question and I will answer it. Maybe Mara knows how also how to answer it. <laughs> sure. So please raise your digital hands. We have a few questions already from Silvia Mishanie. Please, you are unmuted. You can speak. Silvia? Silvia, let's try. No, okay. So Adrian Weiss, can you speak? You can ask your question. Adrian? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. So there are reports about drugs that make worse and complicate the disease like uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and some hypertensive drugs like the H inhibitors. Ma, uh, uh, yes. Sorry. Yes, uh, I understand. I... Yeah, and uh, you know, most of the hypertensive patients are treated with this pharmaceutical class. Yes, I can answer it. Okay. Uh, the, the experience from China is that, uh, that uh, steroids and non-steroidal drugs do not help. And really, uh, we know that once these drugs act, they act by weakening the immune system. And by weakening the immune system, they give a virus a chance to replicate more efficiently. So that's probably why uh, steroids and non-steroidal drugs do not help against viruses in general and specifically against coronaviruses and they are not used now in the western world there was a second question yes uh, oh yeah about uh, uh, um, drugs lowering the blood pressure yeah as as any inhibitors okay yeah the ace 2 inhibitors as you saw uh, in, the, in one of my slides, the ACE2 is really the receptor for the virus. It's what the virus recognizes on the cells. So these inhibitors do not help because they, they, they don't have any antiviral effect. They don't block the ACE2. They work on a different mode of action. The, the reports are that they make worse the disease they make worse because the patient is under stress and probably the drug is more toxic under these conditions it's mean what you say the people they should carry only this treatment 
yeah, should be more careful. Yeah, definitely. This, gr this group of people are in a more risky uh, section of the population. We know that heart patients and high blood pressure are more uh, are, are in risk, high risk. And when you speak about availability of drugs within two months, what do you have in mind? Which kind of drugs? I have chloroquine and I have a remedsevir that I mentioned before that came from a Gilead company. They show a quite good effects, but we don't have statistic yet. So we need more, more patients to be treated. And we, so we need several weeks at least uh, to, to see what, what, what is the effect of these drugs compared to people who have not gotten it. Yeah. But it's now, it's, a, it's now in a fast track and I'm sure that within a few weeks we'll know about it more. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We now have Yvonne Eichel. Yvonne, you can speak. Hello, Yvonne. Okay. Let's, yeah. Is there anything to learn from autoimmune disease and cytokine storms? Yeah, that's a good question. Excellent. Yeah. Actually, the, the disease, the coronavirus disease, is caused by initially destroying the cells, the virus comes into the lungs and destroy uh, the lung cells. But then the immune, what we call the innate immune response of the body, which is the first line of defense against viruses, overreacts against the infection. And by overreaction against the infection, immune cells that comes into the lung, start secreting cytokines. Cytokines are a defense, should be defense against virus infection. But if you have too many of them, too much of them, they become toxic to the lung tissue. So what happened, paradoxically, the immune system, which should help us against the virus, overreact, and by overreaction, it caused a damage. So subsequent to the initial damage by the virus, our immune system exacerbate the damage, and now we get uh, what is called cytokine storm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Moti Anavi, you can talk. Hi, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Panet. Um, my question has to do with chloroquine and hydrochloroquine. I wanted to understand why is it that they work other than the fact that it, they were tried and seem promising? What's the mechanism behind uh, their success? Yeah, okay. These are old, these drugs are old, one century old uh, drugs against uh, malaria. And they have been working pretty well against malaria. And then uh, virologists have tried it against viruses. Uh, these drugs are known to block one of the mechanisms by which viruses enter the cell. This mechanism is called endocytosis. And this is a, a common mechanism for virus entry into the cell. And by blocking this, cellular mechanism, they can also block the virus entry into the cell. But Thank again, it's also toxic. It's not a, a it's a toxic uh, drug. So it's used, but you cannot go up in the level, in the, in the dose of the drug due to toxicity. Oh, oh okay. My, my understanding was it was relatively safe or uh, it was well understood in that uh, regard. Yeah, at, uh, at the concentration, at the dose that it's used, it's safe. I see. Thank you very much. You know, every drug is safe at one range 
and at high dose, it starts being toxic. Right. Thank you. Um, we now have Boutros Halak. Halak. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Thank you, first of all, for this interesting uh, lecture. I have a couple of questions that are almost related, but I'm interested in understanding if there is any studies that for characterization of the protein of the coating for the virus. And oh yeah, that... you no know other viruses that have similar chemical coating structure. Please. There is one 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 virus which is quite similar, and this is a SARS virus, the virus which caused the epidemic in 2002-2003 and uh, we have quite a lot of knowledge about this virus and now we compare this old virus the SARS to the COVID-19 the new virus and they are, they are pretty similar there are many proteins which share a lot of homology and uh, so it helps us a lot in our studies of the new corona uh, proteins, and it will help us a lot also in the development of vaccines against this uh, COVID-19. Do you think that there can, it can be used as a method for sensing a virus at low uh, concentration or exposure? Uh, the only way for sensing is uh, what I described in, uh, at the beginning of the lecture, it's uh, the PCR technology that identify a vir viral genome. But we don't have any sensitive method to detect the virus itself rather than its uh, genetic code. So it should be developed through the, its RNA and you say that uh, characterization through its coding is not really enough. No, no. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Irene Zeitun. Irene, you can speak. And can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you very, very much for this uh, very interesting um, um, presentation. Um, I have uh, two questions. One of them, you uh, mentioned the Tamiflu preventive effect, uh, meaning that if you take it on day, day zero, even before you know that you have the flu, uh, you can prevent uh, the development of the influenza. Yes. How, what is the mode of action of this? Uh... this? This drug blocks the exit of the virus from the cell. And by the way, it's given some time you know, in, uh, in, in ch for children in uh, kindergartens and in uh, people living uh, under, uh, you know, uh, containment situation from, uh, from influenza. So sometimes it's given as a prophylactic drug. You know, when there is a big epidemic in the winter, sometimes mm -hmm. some people are getting it. So once you block the, the exit of these uh, uh, viruses outside, what happens to the cell and what happens to the viruses? Well, once you block, then the cell that have the virus is, is dying, but the virus doesn't release out and cannot infect new cells around, neighboring cells. Yeah. So we get initial infection but then the infection is aborted because the virus cannot spread, spread all over the lung. Mm -hmm. and, and last questions. Uh, recently, uh, we heard about a pill that is given to um, a high risk uh, population against AIDS, which is also prophylactic. Do you know anything about it? Do you know what is the mode of action of this? And yeah, it's, it's it basically, it? Or it's, it, well, this, this drug that's taken before sexual relation, for example, this drug is basically the cocktail, the same drugs that we have in a cocktail. Mm. But once the virus initiates the infection and it finds in the blood already 
the drugs, they kill the virus immediately. So the virus doesn't have a chance to establish itself in the body. So why can't we use it for corona? Because these drugs are not very efficient against corona. Mm. It's only one drug which is used now against corona. Out of the cocktail, only one drug is used against corona. And it's, it's debatable whether it's really uh, efficient or not. It's not clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mara? Sorry, I didn't open Mara. the microphone. Yeah. We have now Andrea Stern. Please, you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, given that people are dying from this, and we know who's high risk, I know you say they still need to do studies on the couple of the drugs you mentioned, such as the hydrochloroquine and the remdesivir. But with consent, um, why aren't we trying to at least save those who are the sickest? Is it due to a lack of supply? Um, and the other question is, Tammy flu, does it only work for the influenza virus? No, the chloroquine doesn't work for influenza. The chloroquine works for, for the corona, the, for the COVID-19. Oh, no, Sorry, what I was asking was two part question. One was, given that people are dying, given that there is some evidence that the chloroquine or hydro hydroxychloroquine may work, why are we not using it on those who are sickest to try and save them? Is it due to supply? No, no, I'm sure that they are being given to people who are very serious, seriously ill, you know, under compassion treatment, but uh, usually when you do clinical trials, when you really want to know the efficacy, you usually you don't take the most sick people because uh, you, you don't want, in case of toxicity, you don't want to harm them. So if you do clinical trials, you know, under normal situation, usually you do it on people who are sick, but not the sickest. But there is a path that the FDA uh, approve, and this is compassionate treatment. So if a doctor at the hospital decide that he wants to take, to give the patient chloroquine, he can do it. He, he fill a form, and the uh, form goes to the director of the hospital, he approve it, and then he can get uh, any drug. So it's being given, I'm sure. Okay, so I guess I, I'm calling from Canada. We're getting emails saying don't use it. So I, again, I don't know what's happening in the hospital. I just know from those of us who are working out of our offices. Um, the other thing is you said Tammy flu is only effective against the influenza virus. Has it been studied against the coronavirus at all? Against influenza, against influenza virus, it doesn't work very well. And as I said, we have a drug, a good drug against influenza virus. The problem is the timing. When do we know that we have influenza? By the time that we know that we have influenza, it's too late. And uh, of course, if we could have given a chloroquine before we infe being infected, it could have been better, but we wouldn't take chloroquine that is toxic before we, we get infected as a prophylactic. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have time for two more questions. We have Mr. Ezekiel Adler. Mr. Adler. Okay, no answer. So Mr. Ilan Zafran. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yeah. First, uh, thank you, Professor Pane, for this presentation. Um, I want to ask about uh, the H2 receptor and about antibodies that were uh, designed to block the interaction. Uh, are there any 
different receptors that could be involved also for the uh, infiltration of the virus into the cells, or this is the only one? No, probably there is more. The, probably there is at least one more. And uh, for the, again, for the SARS virus, we know what is a second receptor. And uh, probably the same receptor also for uh, the COVID-19. But we don't have any, there are, some prot there are some inhibitors for the second receptor, in fact. But I don't know how much they have been tried yet. And I'm sure they will be tried in the future, in the near future. But it's a good question. There is a second receptor. And in fact, there is a, an approved drug that is known to block the second receptor. This, this is very new, very new data. I understand. My second question is about the patients that uh, recover from the viruses. Do we know which kind, with, which immune cells are involved and they are uh, to fight the virus in the, from the innate immune system? Or? Well, when, when we, we recover from the infection, then our what we call adaptive immune system is, is ready to fight any virus which will come in the future. So we know that we raise antibodies, good antibodies that will neutralize any virus in the future. And we also elicit cells, cells which again, part of the immune system that once a new virus will come, they will also fight the new virus. So all arms, of our, uh, of our, what we call adaptive immune system are geared up now to fight the next infection, the second infection. And probably, and we, we have some data that people who recovered from COVID-19 are immune against further infection with COVID-19. So they can go to work, they can, they can, uh, be free out of restrictions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have our last question. Mr. Rothvarg, Eugene Rothvarg. Hi, Professor Panet, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, my question is, uh, uh, after uh, SARS epidemics, was uh, there effective vaccine developed against SARS or those efforts were abandoned because there was no need anymore because SARS did not come back? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, after the SARS epidemic, there were attempts to develop a vaccine. None of the vaccine was good enough, uh, in, in animal models at least. And... Uh, there was not much effort, uh, both in China, where it started, and in the United States and in other countries, there was not much effort to develop a good vaccine against SARS. Uh, I hope that we will learn from this epidemic that we shouldn't give up and we should continue to, to develop vaccines, both against SARS and against COVID-19, even though the epidemic has gone away. Uh, we learn a lot. We learn a lot from each virus that we develop vaccine against. How to do it for the next virus. And uh, I think that uh, the entire approach now to science uh, has changed now, medical science in, in particular, and governments will be more, uh, more amenable to, to spend money on research and development of, of uh, vaccines and other measures of, uh, of uh, infectious diseases. Uh, could we assume that uh, if um, a vaccine against SARS would be developed in time, uh, like fight against current epidemics of uh, COVID-19 would be much more successful? Uh, we, it would be kind no, of uh, I, very useful uh, to develop a vaccine against COVID-19 if there I, would be available vaccine against SARS. I agree with you. I agree with you completely. And, but look, we have, we have the vaccine against influenza. We know that it will come every year. We know that it will kill at least 200,000 people around the world each year, 2,100 people. 
and uh, we still don't have a good vaccine. And this is again for lack of resources, because with, with the good resources, I'm sure that we could have come with a vaccine, what we call a pan vaccine, which will be good for many years, not every year a new vaccine, and we will be able to save many people. But it's like, you know, like traffic accidents. We accept it as something which is uh, normal. When we get a pandemic like COVID-19, then people get up, you know, and, 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 and realize that we, we have neglected uh, these areas of research. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. Thank you all for your attention. And I enjoyed very much talking to you. I'm sorry that we couldn't do it face to face. And I'm, I'm, I, I invited you all to come to Jerusalem and visit me in my lab. Thank you very much, Professor Panet. Thank you to all. Uh, we have another webinar tomorrow. Hope to see you, virtually see you there. And uh, you will receive the recording uh, tomorrow during the day. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mara. Thank you.